13. I will read. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God um, had not yet uh, gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay down, lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, uh, Christine, for reading the word of the Lord to us. Uh, please keep your Bibles open as we feast um, on this glorious uh, gospel. And now, lead us in a time of prayer. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Lord, we pray this morning that through your glorious gospel, you would speak, you would speak, O oh Lord, and that you would help us to receive the food of your holy word would you take your truth and plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us through this glorious gospel into your likeness? Would you light your bright in the darkest corners of our lives? And would you make us wise for your glory and for our joy? In Jesus' name, amen. For those of us who love to hear of main points, uh, if you forget everything I say this morning, perhaps carry this with us 
the God restores his word through Samuel in all Israel. God restores, reestablishes, reinstates his word in all Israel. And therefore, delight, delight, be gladdened in his word. Be gratified in our glorious Savior. A man and his wife were having some marital problems at home and were giving each other the silent uh, treatment. If you've actually dated or married, silent treatment is not a new vocabulary in your space or in my space. Suddenly, this man realized that the next day he would need his wife to wake him up at 5 a.m. for an early morning uh, flight. His ego all over the map and not wanting to be the first to break the silent treatment and therefore lose the battle, he wrote on a piece of paper, please wake me up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. And he left it strategically in a place he knew she would actually find it and see it. The next morning, the man woke up only to discover, lo and behold, it was 9 a.m. And he had missed the business flight. Furious and angry, ready to kill someone, he was about to go and see why his wife had not wakened him, uh, almost from the dead. When he noticed a little tiny paper placed in a place the wife knew, he also would never miss it by the bed. And the paper said, it's 5 a.m., wakey, wakey. <laughs> Church family, I'm not trying to make fun of silent treatment and all its accompanying ugliness. Yet, the chapter we've read shows us that there was actually a time when God withdrew from the sons of Israel and treated them to silent treatment, he gave them a dreadful and deafening silence due to their sin. The chapter before us makes much of the word of God in Israel. Oh, how a beautiful chapter it is. Both in its opening remarks, especially verse 1b, it says, And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And when you go even to verse 21, which is almost its closing verse, it says, <clears throat> Sorry, and the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord both in its opening and closing remarks, this is a chapter that makes much of the word of God in Israel. And that in a nutshell, that opening and closing remarks cracks up the thrust of the chapter for our munching. And so in a, in, in a way of outline, we will look at it from verse 1 to 10, which I've dubbed missing God's word. Missing God's word. Then verse 11 to 18, hearing God's word. And verse 19 all the way to chapter 4, verse 1a, restoring God's word. Missing, hearing, and restoring of God's word. Verse 1 and 10, missing God's word. The word of God was rare and scarce in Israel. Those are the opening statements in chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare and scarce in those days. While Israel had formal motions of religion, it's tragic to note that they are actually without the word of the Lord, without God. They are hopeless without his glorious word. If we were to put it in a different way, we would say they have a famine of God's word. 
Their lot is in spiritual darkness. That was the order of the day. Judges in its closing says, everyone in Israel is doing as they pleased. Dark, without God, without his glorious word. Their goal, that is the sons of Israel, was to be like the nations around them. And to this end, there was a dreadful, deafening silence as they ran to their idols and abandoned Yahweh. The land is still and silent without the voice, without the word of God. God's word in Israel is infrequent. Visions are few and far in between. God's priests, priests, as we saw last Sunday, as Ken articulated it for us, were corrupt. They are described with the worst of adjectives, worthless men who treated God with contempt. Yet, friends, church family, it's in this era of spiritual darkness and spiritual dullness characterized by an absence of God and his word that the narrator rouses our curiosity in a rather young apprentice, in a young intern, Samuel. The scene is of him relentlessly ministering to the Lord. What a nice of Africa in turn. So given to the work of the Lord. And notice, what a strange time to be serving before the Lord. One, the word of God is rare. He is growing in a home of corrupt, worthless men. Bad example heralded before him all his life. Yet we are told again and again in these short opening chapters of the book of Samuel that Samuel is steadfast and determined in his ministry to Yahweh. Last Sunday was shown a number of verses, chapter 2, verse 11, verse 18, 21, and verse 26, and the opening key word in chapter 3, verse 1. Samuel is doing nothing else but ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And one wonders, for how long will this last? For how long? Is change coming soon? With an aging, dim, dulled priest whose sons are corrupt and worthless, how long, O oh Lord, will this last? How long, how long will you be silent? And while you're thinking about these kinds of questions, the narrator is unrelenting. He, he goes further to say, at this time, in verses 2, at this time, the old priest is shown as old. His eyesight is dim, dull, faint and foggy. And the mat metaphor here shows that this condition is not just physically, it's also spiritually. The condition is heartbreaking. No wonder the visions are rare. The priest is old. He is dull, dim, and blind. And to rub salt to the wound, the high priest is lying down. Where? Petty details. In his own place. In sharp contrast to Samuel, who is lying somewhere different, and will be coming to that. Eli's biting darkness is a prominent and striking, heartbreaking illustration. We would say in Sheng, in a shout, his conditions is so shouting of the bleak, bleakness of the situation that is before Israel. God's silence, coupled with Eli's blindness, is a crisis in the making. But the narrator gives us some hope when he writes, the lamp of God 
had not yet gone out. That is in verse 2. Almost pointing that there is a young apprentice. There is an intern who is growing in this home of this old, blind-going priest. And while Eli is lying down in his own place, as I have had mentioned, Samuel is lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the Lord was. What a set-off and distinction between these two. And let me tell you, friends, up to this point, the stage is set. The tensions, the drums are rolling. Something is cooking up. Something is coming up pretty fast. We would say, if you love Swahili, gafla bin vu, what was rare and infrequent. Kile kilichokuwa kimeadimika, kuliko wali wanini. This very night, in verse 4, this very night, as Pastor Fidel taught us some two weeks ago, the God who reverses, the God who turns tables, comes to Samuel. In verses 4, it says, Then the Lord called Samuel. You come to verse 6, it says, And the Lord called again Samuel. And you go to verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Friends, finally, God is speaking and calling. He is no longer what Israel is no longer in the place where it was in verses 1. God no longer wants to be rare, absent, and infrequent among his people. What a marked and special night this must have, have been. You know, if a Kenyan was writing this, would have seen, this is my year. This is that very night when the Lord comes calling. What a special night. The sad thing, though, is that it's at the third round that the high priest of Israel is actually starting to note, perceive and discern that this is a different night in all of Israel. Something worth honoring and glorifying is happening. And in verse 9, we are told that therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Remember, this is in the temple, in the presence of the Lord, where the ark of the Lord is. And then we almost should start wondering, is the Lord going to come again? This has been so rare. Will he come? He's done this thrice, and the prophet of God, the high priest, has missed it thrice. Will the Lord come again? Come with me to verse 10. What a glorious verse in a nation that had not experienced God for such a long time. It says, and the Lord came. He came and stood and called at us as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. You know, the narrator seems to be contrasting verse 1 and verses 10. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Then you come to verse 10. God is no longer sporadic. He is no longer once in a blue moon, scarce, infrequent God. The narrator actually uses several words there. The Lord came, then he stood, and he calls Samuel. God is visiting with he, this nation through this young apprentice. What a remarkable night. 
that even though they continue to miss his word, he comes to them. He calls again and again. And come with me to verses 11 all the way to 18. This night is an unusual night. And it's a wonder in Israel. And the message that the young Samuel is about to receive is also an unusual message. It is an unexpected. Come with me to verses 11 all the way to 14. The narrator tells us, Then the Lord says, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel. And then God is saying, At which the two ears of everyone, another petty detail there, I could have said everyone will hear, and their ears will tingle. He says, two ears. Two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God. He did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. The Lord is confirming through Samuel a message he had delivered earlier on to Eli. The Lord will judge and punish the house of Eli. And we have previously seen dark things, heartbreaking things with this family. Eli has previously mistaken a needy, broken, praying, interceding woman for being a worthless drunk in the house of the Lord. Eli has been shown by the narrator as being in cahoots, ennobling the corruptedness of his worthless sons. In this chapter, thrice he does not recognize nor discern the voice of the Lord calling the young Samuel. And while in charge of Israel as a high priest, the word of the Lord in, Israel, in all Israel becomes rare with infrequent versions. See how God puts it, judging him before a young boy in verses 13. I am about to punish his house forever. Why? For the iniquity he knew. He saw, he knew it. And what does he go on to say? His sons were blaspheming God. He did nothing to restrain them. God says that Eli knew. He did not even try to warn them. He did not try to restrain his worthless, nasty, trashy sons as they treated God with contempt and hate. And what this means is that it's too late. It's too late. The opportunity for repentance is past. God is simply telling Samuel, there is no hope for these boys. What a heartbreaking, fearful message. Now, let me just create an imagery for you to, to, to show you why this must have been a shaking message. Samuel must have had grown with Eli's sons. Same home. Bodies. Perhaps they were older than him. And that is why this message must have shaken this young boy. Verse 15 tells us, Samuel lay until morning. I wonder if the young Samuel did sleep at all that night. He must perhaps been wishing, ah, the world should open up and swallow me. Afadhali asubui isifike. How do I deal with such devastating news? How do I even deliver them to a mentor, to a father figure 
who's walked with me throughout my life. Samueli atatoa wapi nguvu na uwezo to share such a message. If he lived in our generation, he should perhaps, this is me thinking, he is asking, ile kiatu ya kukanyagia story, itatoka wapi? It's already a night, all the shops are closed, can't find such a shoe. How do you break such breaking news to an old man who is running blind? You might give him a heart attack. Then his family and the sons of Israel who are so wicked start accusing you. You did this deliberately so that you can become the next high priest. And that the narrator knows this means this message eventually gets to all the sons of Israel. No wonder God would say everyone in Israel with two ears who hears this will tingle. And you come to verse 18. It tells us this young boy eventually wakes up after mulling over this the whole night, perhaps even rehearsing how when asked he will say it as a trembling teenager. How will I communicate this effectively? How can I be winsome when saying it? From verse 17 or 16, Eli calls Samuel and he calls him, my son. Samuel is always saying, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. So on one side, Eli is so loving. Then he changes colors and becomes a firm father figure. Do not hide it from me. Jaribu one. Nita kufinya. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. And in 18, so Samuel told him everything. He did nothing from him. And the high priest says it's the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Come with me to verse 19 all the way to 4, 1. God is no longer mteja wanambari hapatikani kwa sasa in Israel. God is no longer like an inaccessible, unreachable network. He is no longer rare. And how does he do this? He matures and establishes in Israel his prophet in Samuel. The tables are turned and reversed. The narrator tells us Samuel grows, maturing physically and spiritually. And then he starts to tell us, and the Lord was with him. That is what verse 19 says. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. That means Samuel is growing, maturing physically and spiritually. Nothing compares to the Lord being with his prophet, Samuel. Perhaps no wonder, Paul, thinking about the Lord being with us, he says in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, if God be with us, who can be against us? The Lord was with Samuel. The second thing the Lord does is that he lets none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Samuel's word in Israel is equated to God's word. The Lord reveals himself to Samuel. That's another thing the Lord does. By the word of the Lord. And you know what? All Israel... All Israel, we are even told from Dan to Beersheba, from corner to corner, north, south, east, and west, they all bear witness to the fact that the Lord is establishing the young Samuel as a credible, reliable, faithful prophet of 
God. And finally, in chapter 4, verse 1, hear how the narrator puts it. And the word of God, the word of Samuel, came to all Israel. The word of Samuel is the word of the Lord, comes to all Israel. This means that all Samuel's prophecies came to pass and came to be known by everyone, even his accusers. There stands the man of God. And what he is proclaiming is the word of the Lord. Restoration is happening here, church family. Restoration in Israel is happening right here. Let me remind you, if you have actually walked with us since we started Genesis, Exodus, all the way to the book of 1 Samuel, the last time Israel had this kind of the presence of God was for some 400 years ago in the times of Moses. Since the day of Moses, 400 years ago, there has come up many prophets and judges, some worthless, some certainly no great, some certainly no godly prophets. Yet in all Israel's history, Samuel is rightly seen as Israel's last judge and first prophet. He is bridging in the gap at the time of the judges, and he is ushering in the time of the monarchy when prophets like Nathan and Elijah and Isaiah influenced the nation of Israel. Friends, at this important time in Israel's history, God raises up a faithful, godly prophet. When the word of God was rare, when God was almost absent and had withdrawn from the people so that they lived as they pleased, God is bringing back the word of Yahweh in Israel. And friends note, no longer will everyone live as they please. No longer will everyone follow after worthless idols and worthless priests. But according to the word of the Lord. So friends, let me ask, what will you and I do with the word of God in First Samuel? What will you and I do? With the word, the glorious word of God in First Samuel. Israel is a nation experiencing darkness and utter emptiness. Leadership crisis. Worthless men are in office. Blind, dull, and dim. They have a form of religion in Shiloh with the ark of the Lord yet they run after idol worship, everyone living as they place. You'd actually think that what God would give to such a nation is a mighty, glorious warrior to lead them to war. But God does the opposite. He brings right at the center God's word. He sends them his glorious word. And he does this from the smallest of houses in Israel. Through the smallest of women called Hannah. God raises a young, faithful, reliable, godly prophet. And he restores his word in Israel. All Israel, corner to corner, one faithful man. In Israel... The hashtag is of the trendy topic right now is God is no longer silent. They are telling each other when they meet in the streets, Awa Yahweh is a God who speaks. He is a speaking God. Israel can now hear and obey the voice of Yahweh. Friends, the way the the reformers put it was after darkness, light in Israel. That happened even before the reformers ever came into the scene of the world. 
after darkness, a greater light, a brighter light shines in Israel. First Samuel 3, God validates, God affirms, he raises Samuel, Samuel as his prophet, by clearly speaking to all of Israel through him. And centuries later, he even does something more glorious. He validates and affirms an even greater prophet than Samuel, Jesus Christ. And as he had spoken through Samuel, validating every word with clarity, allowing no word of Samuel to fall to the ground, through Jesus, he has spoken to you and I infallibly, extensively, exhaustively, through his word in all of our lives. After darkness, light shines forth. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, this is what we are told about this glorious word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with who? With God. And the word was? He was in the beginning with who? God. This word is not simply mere letters inscribed in a book. It's a person, Jesus Christ. And the narrator of Hebrews, almost interpreting John 1, tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, that long ago, long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, church family, he has spoken to us by who? His son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the whole world. Friends, after darkness, light shines forth. Love how Isaiah puts it. The people living in darkness, in the rarity of the gospel, in the scarcity of God's word, have seen a great light in Jesus Christ. Friends, the rarity and the scarcity of God's word we see in chapter 3 from verse 1, where everyone is doing what was right and pleased in their own eyes as it was in Israel, please note that this is a recurring feature throughout the church age. Be it in churches, be it in our homes, be it in our nation and nations of the world and continents of the world, and worse of it all, even in our own personal, private spaces. Don't leave this service thinking you and I are Samuel. No. You are not Samuel at all. You and I are those who, like Israel, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, reject God. We run after idols. We crawl out of the pages of Scripture and live on our own terms. We are those judges who describe everyone lived as they placed, as they saw right in their eyes. Friends, we are, we are those who, like Eli, whose love grows cold and dim and dull and blind. That's my son, Teula, encouraging me. Scripture would say we are those who are blind and naked. We are those who forget the gospel daily. We are those who treat God with contempt, throwing our hands up in the air, treating him to deafening, dreadful, silent treatment. We are like, you have spoken? Ah, skutambui. Sikufil. We have our Lord in spiritual darkness, having a form of godliness, motions of active 
religion, Christian names, resemblance of Christianity. Yet when we are weighed, we are found wanting without God. God's word being rare in our lives, in our churches, in our homes, in our nations. If our lot was to be described, the right adjectives and words would be farming of the word of God. Those would feature prominently. The absence of God and his word. And some, some of us would be described as divorced from scripture. Rarity of God's word, even in our very own lives. Friends, could be the Lord be asking you and I this morning, is the Bible being read and preached faithfully here at Grace Point Church, Kikuyu? I know we are gospel-centered, but we need to be asking us this again and again. Is the Bible being read aright and preached faithfully here in our church? Are you and I expositional gospel lovers? Or the whole time during sermons, we are not feeding well, we are no longer present, and when we come, we are weighed down by concerns and worries, distracted. Fathers and mothers and husbands, I don't want to guilty trip us, but is the Bible being read aright and faithfully preached in our homes? consistently are we decreasing is Christ increasing would we be described as hungry and thirsty after the gospel according to Jesus the psalmist one once wrote a tribute to Jesus Christ who is the glorious word an amazing tribute in Psalm 119. And I hope we would say some few statements in this psalm. Your word have I hid in my heart. Not strategies, not some seminars and those things are, God, are good. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Church family, would we start saying this year and beyond with the psalmist that I delight, I am gladdened, I am gratified, I am pleasantly surprised in your word. I will not forget your word. Friends, would we open our hearts and cry this morning with the psalmist, open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things in your word. And oh, I love what he says next. next. Give me life. Give me strength according to your word. And you would think that psalmist would stop there. He goes on to say, oh, how I love your word. I meditate on it all day long. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And I could go on and on and on in this tribute of Jesus Christ and his glorious gospel. But my prayer this morning, even in a land where there is rarity of gospel lovers, I pray that you and I would be hearing the word of God, that you and I would be reading, munching the word of God, that we would be studying, memorizing, meditating, doing and living and delighting delighting in the word of God. Friends, you and I must be delighting in Christ. He is the word come flesh. And if we are not doing these things, I think God is calling you and I this morning to repent and turn to God so that our sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Bonas, if you were.
Yes, such a good word, uh, such a good afternoon. And we are grateful to God for such a great word that we have heard from uh, Pastor Bernard. And uh, just before we reflect, I just want to remind us some of the points. And um, I think um, on a light note, uh, Nitaona Ken Kando, 